Our next speaker we're very excited to have is Chaim Sumpolinski from both Hebrew University and Harvard University, as well as a, he is a faculty on the methods of computational neuroscience at the MBL, the Marine Biology Lab. Um, he's won many prizes, among them the Emmett Prize and the Schwartz Prize. And uh, we're very excited to have him here today to talk about uh, deep manifolds. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I uh, would like to present some different aspects of mathematics of deep, uh, deep networks. Uh, I'll specifically talk about uh, the relation between geometry, geometry in, in high dimension, uh, and, uh, and computation in deep networks. Uh, so um, before I start, I would like to uh, uh, thank my collaborators, Dan Lee uh, from Cornell and Samsung, uh, Suyun Chang, she is now a postdoc at Columbia, and Uri Cohen, who is uh, a PhD student at Hebrew University, and there are other uh, collaborators which I'll mention later on. Okay, so I'm going to uh, cover I'm going to cover is it, is it okay? I'm going to cover uh, a few uh, topics. Uh, first of all, uh, the mathematics of uh, classification geometry of, of manifolds. Um, I'll then uh, uh, apply those mathematical uh, theoretical concepts to uh, object manifolds in uh, deep convolutional networks, specifically uh, about uh, image net uh, type of data in vision. Uh, then I'll show some results, uh, attempts to apply them uh, and to compare mm -hmm. with the uh, deep convolutional networks uh, uh, neural data from uh, monkey uh, visual cortex. Um, and finally, I'll talk about ongoing work uh, about uh, geometry of manifolds in relation not uh, to uh, uh, cl high, high capacity classification, but to the problem of generalization. And um, uh, topic number one is published. Uh, topic number two is on the archive. Uh, I hope very much to get to uh, three and four, which uh, are not published yet. OK, so uh, manifolds uh, in the context of processing of uh, sensory information and categorization, discrimination, uh, um, uh, rise naturally from, uh, from the well-known fact that uh, uh, objects uh, and other uh, categories uh, are uh, full of uh, variability in the physical instantiations of, uh, of those concepts or categories. It can be faces uh, with different pose, different location in, in the scene, uh, backgrounds, uh, uh, occlusions, uh, orientation, and so on and so forth. Uh, it has been uh, 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 proposed uh, by, uh, by several authors in context of uh, deep networks, but in other contexts in computational neuroscience, more generally, is that the, the role of, uh, of at least uh, one aspect of the, of the computational role of hierarchy in the neural network or in sensory uh, uh, processing in particular, for instance, in the visual hierarchy, uh, is to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, reformat the information from the input layer uh, through the different stages to the output layer. And that reformatting uh, means that the system doesn't uh, add information to the sensory input. It may lose or may not lose information along the way. We can uh, assume that there is no loss of information. Then naturally, the question is what is gained by just reformatting the same uh, inputs uh, across the stages of the, of the hierarchy. And the, the one possible answer is that the reformatting uh, allows downstream systems uh, to uh, better decode or read out uh, that information. And uh, this is from DiCarlo and, uh, and, and Cox uh, paper uh, illustrating that, uh, for instance, if you have two uh, persons and you have images, a set of uh, images correspond to the two persons, then uh, at the pixel layer uh, on, at the left, uh, those uh, sets of uh, of uh, inputs uh, or in images corresponding to one person uh, and the set corresponding to another person are very, uh, uh, very convoluted and uh, entangled, uh, and they cannot be separated by, uh, by linear separator. So they are not, uh, uh, for the sake of the argument, uh, 
uh, they are nonlinearly separable, so they can be separated, but you need a, a, a very complex machinery uh, to, to separate them, and, and that is one of the machinery that separate them by reformatting them so that at the top layers, uh, this the same uh, set of, uh, uh, of inputs are now, uh, are now nicely separated into two uh, manifolds which are untangled and easily separated by, uh, by a, a linear classifier. So that's, uh, that's uh, the idea, and uh, similarly you can think about the same story with deep networks, again reformatting from uh, the first layer to the top layers, uh, so that uh, as usually is done, the top layer is just acted upon by um, more or less a linear uh, discriminator uh, to, uh, to perform the task. So the questions which I'd like to address is uh, uh, this idea that uh, uh, deep networks are reformatting and, uh, and uh, flattening or uh, uh, disentangle uh, manifolds, uh, how, can we quantify that? Can we, um, uh, can we attach some geometric measures uh, to say, well, how much uh, uh, entanglement uh, is enough or unentanglement is enough, uh, uh, and how do we measure this, uh, this entanglement uh, and, uh, to such that uh, at the, at the uh, end of the, of the process, uh, we can do actually uh, invariant categorization by, as I said, by linear uh, readout. Um, and uh, ideally, we would like to have such measures or some uh, uh, framework, mathematical framework, that is, a gen is general enough and is not dependent so much on the specifics of, uh, uh, of the type of node, the type of nonlinearity, the type of operations, uh, that they can be used to compare across uh, different uh, layers in the same network. They can be compared across different networks. They can be compared between natural brain networks and artificial networks, uh, and so on. Um, uh, the, un the underlying uh, challenge is the, for, for many of us that use uh, theory, in particular statistical mechanic theory, which doesn't rely on bounds, on worst case, uh, case scenarios, but more typical cases. But very often typical cases uh, were too naive, uh, simplistic assumptions. Everything was Gaussian and random and uncorrelated and so on. And it was, I think, challenge to uh, apply those, uh, those results, theoretical results, uh, to real life problems. So the question is, can theory, and specifically statistical mechanics based theory, uh, be, be uh, extended uh, to incorporate uh, data and, and tasks which uh, are rich enough to be relevant to real life, uh, uh, real life uh, tasks and therefore can be applied uh, more directly to uh, interesting problems. Okay, so I'm going to use uh, uh, object representation as an example of, of manifold. Um, I, uh, am, I, I would like to, um, uh, to focus on two, uh, two key aspects. One is uh, we would like to um, measure at each uh, layer of a network uh, the representation, the quality of the representation of those, uh, of those uh, manifolds by, uh, by asking how much information about the category resides uh, in, uh, in, in each one, uh, in each layer. But I'm not going to use information in the sense of Tali Tishbi tomorrow. I'm going to use information in the sense of uh, accessible object information. How much uh, information about category resides in a network in a, in a way that can be accessible from this layer directly by linear readout. And then I'm going to ask how much, uh, how computationally relevant geometric characterization of this object representation, and specifically, uh, can we co connect these two aspects of ability to uh, access uh, object information from a given layer and the uh, geometric, uh, geometric properties. Okay, so uh, to formalize what we mean by neural manifold, so the word manifold, there's many interpretation, different contexts. We are using it in, in, in a rather generic or general uh, 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 generic uh, inter, uh, um, definition. So imagine you have uh, n-dimensional uh, state space. So I'm looking at representation of objects uh, and images or inputs, uh, uh, stimuli uh, in a given layer and given neural population uh, have, uh, having n neurons. So uh, 
the, the state space of, uh, of this particular population, this particular layer, uh, is in Rn and dimension. Uh, each point in this n dimension corresponds or represents one, uh, one stimulus, one input, one image. Uh, the collection of all uh, points that are associated with one concept or one object, uh, one category, uh, will be the manifold uh, of that category in this particular uh, uh, population of neurons or this particular layer um, in the state, state space of the, of the network, uh, of, of this layer. Uh, so another category, like a cat, will, be a, will, will generate another, another manifold. So there is no assumption about smoothness and so on. It's just the assumption is that those, uh, those uh, manifold, those collection of points are, are bounded uh, and, and form a compact set. So more formally, we, we write uh, each uh, for, for the muth manifold, and mu will go from 1 to p. p is the number of manifolds. Uh, so each vector in the muth manifold, x mu is a vector in n dimension, can be written as, uh, uh, as a sum of uh, d plus 1 dimensional uh, vectors. So the vectors are the, uh, the u's are the vectors that uh, span, linearly span uh, these manifolds. We assume that these manifolds are low dimensional and d characterizing their dimension. And this uh, sum has d plus 1 vectors because uh, you have to add to this affine expansion also the distance from the center of the, 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 the distance from the origin of the center of the manifold. So altogether you have this form of, uh, of representation of, uh, of points in a given manifold. Uh, so the U's are the, the orientation of the manifold, if you want, the, uh, def defining the subspace. Uh, the SI are the uh, parameters within this subspace that characterize each individual point on the manifold, and they are obeying some geometry or some constraint, which is uh, thus define the, the shape of the manifold within the subspace. So each manifold uh, is defining a subspace, the dimensional subspace, uh, and, uh, and some constraints on the shape of the manifold within the subspace. So that's uh, that basically the, 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 what we mean by neural manifolds. Uh, and the way we, th we, uh, we measure accessible information of categories uh, with this manifold representation is by assigning random binary label to a collection of these manifolds. So we assume there are many of these manifolds uh, in the state space, uh, in the relevant state space. Uh, and uh, the question is, can you uh, decode or classify uh, this uh, binary, uh, binary label uh, by, uh, by a hyperplane? OK. So, um, then the main, uh, one of the main uh, results of, uh, uh, of the, of the uh, statistical mechanical framework of this problem is that the capacity, the maximum number of separ separable manifolds, so P is the number of, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of uh, categories or, or manifolds, so the maximum number of linearly separable manifolds uh, scales linearly with the embedding dimension, with the number of nodes in that layer. Uh, Typically, we have this type of uh, capacity uh, relation or extensive capacity when we talk about separating points, uh, uh, linearly separating points in n dimension. Uh, but this extends to uh, separating, uh, at least for low dimensional manifolds, as you'll see in a minute, this extends to separating manifolds uh, uh, in, in n dimension where uh, if the n manifolds in, are, are compact enough. So uh, I think that's, that's a good relation that you would like to have that under, under reasonable conditions, you have an extensive capacity. So the uh, accessible information about object category per neuron uh, is finite. Uh, so that's, that's what you call alpha, the maximum number of separate manifold per neuron. OK, so that's one concept of capacity. Um, and you can see immediately where, where, where theoretically the bounds are. So if the manifold were just sh shrunk to single points, uh, then the classical results from uh, cover theory and statistical mechanics that uh, the number of those uh, uh, points uh, uh, per neuron is, is the maximum number will be in large system will be two, uh, so alpha will be two. On the other, on the other extreme, if the manifolds are completely uh, point manifolds, so each manifold has m points uh, and they are completely randomly uh, 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 spread, so there is no structure in the manifold except 
aside from random collection uh, of points uh, in, in, the, in, the in the state space, uh, then uh, from here it follows that uh, it's just 2 over m, uh, the number uh, of manifolds that can be, uh, can be separated. So if m is large, if each manifold contains many points, possibly infinite number of points, then this will be very small or zero. The, the intermediate case will be manifold which are basically infinitely in size, in extent, uh, uh, or very large size, but still low dimension. So in that case, the, one can bound the capacity uh, to show that it equal to basically 1 over d, where d is dimensionality of, the, of each manifold. So uh, basically the problem, uh, the challenge uh, is that if m is large, so the number of points per manifold is either finite but large or infinite, or if the dimensional manifolds are low dimension in the sense that d is finite and n can go to infinity, uh, but still d is large, 10, 20, 100, 200, and so on, uh, then uh, this, uh, this capacity will be very small. So we can say that uh, a, a good representation, a bad representation, will be one where, where a capacity is basically given by these bounds, which can be very small. And a good representation is when this alpha is order 1. What is order 1? Point 1, point 2, or whatever. But uh, it's far away from, uh, for, from these bounds. OK. So the highlights of the, uh, of the stat MAC is, uh, as I said, first of all, extensive capacity under, under reasonable condition. Uh, furthermore, uh, alpha C, uh, this capacity, uh, is, uh, uh, is, uh, um, is related uh, very closely uh, to notions of geometry. Of geometry. So uh, mainly two uh, main categories uh, or, of, or geometric uh, uh, features. One is the effective radius of each manifold and the effective dimensionality of this manifold. And I'll, I'll discuss a little bit uh, uh, in a minute uh, what do we mean by this Rm and Dm? What, what is the radius and dimensionality? But given estimate of the radius and dimensionality of, of each manifold, uh, then basically the capacity of an arbitrary shape manifold is more or less like an, a, an, a capacity of spheres uh, with the same radius and dimension. Okay. And then furthermore, the, the, the theory says that uh, separating, uh, separating these two regimes, the bad regime and the good regime, is basically controlled by the scaling law, that if uh, the radius times growth of dimensionality is uh, bigger than one, then we are in a bad regime. If it's less than one, we are in a good regime. So what it, what it means, uh, uh, what, it, what do we mean by radius and dimensionality? And for this, I need to uh, uh, remind you about the notion of support vectors. So imagine we have points, uh, simply points that want to separate by a hyperplane, but a max margin hyperplane. Uh, then, um, uh, then we know that uh, in this case, the, 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 the weight vector uh, uh, separating the, the max margin separation, separator can be written in terms of a subset of points, which are the support vectors. It's, very, uh, we all know about it. So, th so basically, we defined anchor points in the, in, in, in the manifold context uh, by noting that you can write down, if the manifolds are linear separable, you can write down the separating, uh, the max margin separator W, again, as the linear sum of uh, support vectors. However, in this case, uh, you can write it in such a way that uh, only one support vector per manifold Appear in this, uh, appears in this sum. So basically, you have a representative from each manifold, at most one representative vector, that actually controls the, the, the separating plane. Uh, and this, uh, this support vector, uh, this uh, what we call uh, an Acom point, uh, is, um, uh, is, uh, lies either on the manifold itself or on the convex hull of the manifold. Uh, and that we will call uh, an anchor point. So we, we are basing the geometry of the manifold uh, on, uh, on the notion of those uh, support, uh, support vectors or anchor points of the manifolds. And the idea is now, how do we get from this to, how do we get from this to geometry is basically to ask what is the statistical, what is the distribution of those, uh, of those vectors? So we can think about them, the distribution across the whole set of manifolds. But we can also say, Take one manifold, as shown here. So here is a, let's focus on this blue manifold. 
Uh, now the, it's surrounded by many other manifolds, and there is some linear separator. And in this particular example, for instance, this point here will be the anchor point contributed by this manifold to the separating plane. It will be on the margin. However, if you, uh, if you now leave the same manifold as it is, but rotate around the other manifold, then now the linear separator of this manifold together with others uh, will, 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 will generate another anchor point on the same manifold, and so on and so forth. So what you get is by changing randomly the, the, the realization of the other manifold, the environment uh, that this manifold is embedded in, uh, you basically move the anchor point around. And that basically induces a measure on, uh, on each one of the manifolds. So basically, the, the distribution of, uh, of anchor points uh, are the collection of points on, uh, on the manifold, on, on its convex hull, that are important for separating this particular manifold from some random uh, re uh, realization of other manifolds. OK, so this is an example from, uh, from an image net, uh, just from, from two manifolds. So this is a, a vase, uh, a vase uh, um, manifold. Uh, typical vase will, will be, look like that. And if you separate this which I from, from, from another, the head cabbage manifold, uh, the, the, uh, the anchor point uh, uh, will look like somewhat uh, in between uh, the cabbage and, and the vase. And similarly, if you take the same vase and separate it from the birdhouse manifold, then the, uh, the anchor point will be, some, will be a, a, a picture of a bird uh, on a vase. So that's kind of the idea that those, uh, the, the, the collection of anchor points on this manifold are the points that are kind of critical to separate them uh, from the other manifolds. Okay, so that's the general idea. Um, and um, so basically the, 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 the outcome uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the theory is that um, you have a high capacity regime where R and D are sufficiently small, low capacity regime when they are large, as I said before. Uh, and here's an, just an example of that. So uh, you, you take ellipsoids in high dimension uh, they have the spectra of radii uh, shown here. Uh, so the actual dimensionality is, in this case, will be full rank. It's uh, n is 1,000, and the naive dimensionality of the many of the ellips uh, ellipsoids are also 1,000. However, the effective dimension, BM, uh, will uh, if you just scale globally all the manifolds uh, with a factor r. So you just do global scale, nevertheless, the effective dimension changes from low R when all the ellipsoids are small in size. Uh, will be the, the dimension basically will be logarithmic in the naive dimension. And then when R is big, then the dimension is, uh, uh, is, is the full dimension. Uh, and that corresponds to a kind of crossover in the capacity, low R will have high capacity and, uh, and high R will have very small capacity for separating the two regimes. So basically, we can see that in this case, an, a deep network will, will, might be in this regime uh, in, in the input layer, but then hopefully in the top layer, it will move to this regime. OK, uh, there are correlations which are skipped. So let, let's look how it, uh, how it, uh, it does for, for image net. So, uh, these are examples, AlexNet, um, VGG, uh, and, um, and ResNet. We, 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 we played with, with many of those. Uh, and we, we looked at, at two uh, types of, of, of manifolds. One, what we call point cloud manifolds. So we did basically, uh, ImageNet, as you know, is about 1,000 uh, images per class and 1,000 uh, classes. Uh, so we take... Um, uh, either all the points uh, or all the images uh, for each class or a subset of them. Uh, and, and so this was a point cloud object manifold. So each class is a manifold. In this case, it would just be a, a finite set of points. So we, we're not trying to learn underlying smooth manifold. It's a, it's, it's a challenging project. We just take the, the point themselves uh, from, from, the, from the data set. Uh, as representing the manifold. So this will be a discrete manifold, set of discrete manifolds, each one for each class. Um, and uh, and uh, the other case is we, we, we want to study more closely uh, a smooth manifold. So we take now a set of images, uh, one image per, per object. Uh, so we're not, we're not separating uh, 
object. We're separating different images. However, each image is now undergoing uh, a fine transformation, uh, uh, translations, so horizontal, vertical, or rotations, or, 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 or uh, shear, and so on and so forth. So now each image uh, corresponds to uh, or generates a, a smooth manifold. So these are two different types of manifolds, but we, would, we wanted to, to see whether they, the result uh, that I'll show uh, is, is very different or there is some uh, a generic trend about uh, what the deep networks do uh, to, uh, <coughs> to, to that such data which, uh, which is common across this uh, very different uh, type of manifolds. Okay, so here is the result for the point cloud manifold for AlexNet. Uh, here, is, uh, here is the capacity, so, the, the ma so uh, for each layer, the maximum number of this point cloud of object categories that can be separated per neuron uh, in, in the layer. So because it's per neuron, you don't have to really work on this 100,000 uh, pixels. You can actually subsample uh, and, and, uh, and measure for a small, uh, small number of neurons, and, and, and it will scale uh, linearly. So that's alpha C. Uh, so what you see here is the increase. So all these, uh, these networks that we measure are trained already, what we call pre-trained networks. We're not training. We're not doing learning. Uh, we just take the, the, the usual, uh, usually uh, trained manifolds, uh, uh, trained networks for, for ImageNet, uh, and we measure the, the representation of, the, of, of these manifolds on the trained network, so for each layer. So this is a per layer here. So you see the capacity really uh, is indeed doing what, uh, what we, uh, we expect, what we were hoping to, to see, that uh, it starts from very low number at the pixel layer uh, and then increase uh, uh, almost order of magnitude uh, uh, to the uh, top feature layer. So now the, the, the actual numbers are, are less important, but perhaps important is to know the beginning here, the point 0.02, what does it mean? Uh, it, it turns, because this is finite number of, of points per manifold, the capacity will not be zero. So this is basically almost like 2 over m, which means that the, the pixel layer, those, the, the categories are basically don't really exist in this sense. The, uh, from the perspective of the pixel layers, uh, the categories basically are a random collection of points uh, with, no, with no really geometric structure. Uh, yeah. So, so, so all the manifolds uh, are for each layer uh, are, are now given uh, given random labels, but the labels uh, I'll emphasize the labels are, are random between manifolds, but are of course uh, the same uh, for, for each for all the points within a manifold. Okay, otherwise the, ran the labels are random and trying to find a binary classifier because half of them and the other half. Okay, thanks for, for asking about that. Uh, so that you can do, and you can, you know, resample, relabel, and compute the statistics of this. Okay, is it clear now? Okay, good. So now this value here uh, for this particular case is more or less uh, of, of very close to uh, to simply random random points per manifold. So you can see it by looking at the dash line here, uh, which is the random uh, random shuffling. So suppose you take uh, the points and between categories and just shuffle them randomly and then call them categories or manifolds, and the, 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 the values are very similar. So for the random shuffle, you will get uh, this flat line. So the manifold, the, the network doesn't do anything. Or it shouldn't do anything for that. You can also have another baseline, which is uh, doing, uh, take the, the real manifolds, not the shuffled ones, but pass it through the network, but now the network will be the initialized network before training, the random the random initialized, the same network randomly initialized. Again, you see uh, a very low improvement, although it's, 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 it's above the random, uh, the random labels, which means that the architecture itself uh, gives uh, some improvement of the, of, the, of the representation, even if the, if the filters are completely random because it's before training. But this is after the full training of the manifold. Then I don't show you data. If you look during training what happens, you see that uh, the transition between this and this is very fast. It's after the first couple of ep epochs, you basically establish the, the manifold structure, and then the rest of them are fine-tuned for the ImageNet uh, 
classification task. Similarly, you see for the dimension, again, after training, there is a, a, an initial, uh, the, the first layers are kind of non-monotonic even in dimension, but then eventually they go down substantially. And similarly for the radius, and again, uh, you see both of them are flat for the other cases. So that's, that's an example of what we mean by capacity improvement through the network uh, and the, in relation to a reduction in dimension and reduction in, in, in the radius. Yes? Yeah, so, uh, so I, um, well, I don't know, I, I think they're happy anyway, uh, but uh, um, I, I, we'll, 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 we'll see some more examples of that and we can, but maybe we can discuss it. So here, here is, again, more examples. This is the same as before, just different format showing it. This is for VGG, and, and again, you see that uh, the, the, the capacity is really hanging low for large part of the, of, the, of the network and then taking off in the latter part. Here is, the, here is for the smooth affine uh, manifolds. So it basically now each manifold is infinite number of points uh, and the capacity of the input layer in this case is really zero uh, or very close to zero and, and then it takes off gradually for AlexNet but for, for deeper networks it's again the most of the improvement is in the in the letter, in, in the in other, in, in the last part of it. Again, I, I'm showing two curves. It's top ten or full class or she on translation doesn't matter, but the trend is the same. <coughs> All right, and here you have an, uh, a kind of a summary of the geometry. So this is this is the, the point cloud manifold for AlexNet uh, and VGG, for dimension and for radius, and this is the same for the smooth affine manifold. And what you see is that dimension uh, is, uh, starts very high and, and also uh, maybe non-monotonic even the layer. So there are some intermediate convolutions, for instance, here that really make the, the, the increase the dimensionality of the manifold. Uh, but eventually, the last part of the, the last stages are reducing very substantially the dimensionality, uh, the radii for both manifolds here and here. So they're not entirely the same shape. Again, the two lines are two different types of, uh, of uh, transformations uh, or subsets of, uh, of the point cloud. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's the same, the same trend, although they're not, the two manifolds, the two types of manifold, the smooth and, and, and the point cloud, are not necessarily, uh, don't show in, in detail the same, the same structure. Here you see pronouns increase in dimensionality. It's more flat. Uh, uh, here the radius goes more gradually and here it's more flat and it calls for a better understanding of these details but, but the bottom line is that if you look at the last stages of those networks they suppress uh, very strongly uh, dimensionality and uh, to some extent the, the radius and that is the, that is the origin of this uh, uh, substantial increase uh, in, the, uh, in the capacity. Okay, and finally I want to show the kind of correspondence between the capacity by the theory, I mean field, and capacity by direct uh, simulation of, uh, of those uh, separating uh, discrimination tasks. And you see very nice uh, uh, correspondence. So uh, we are very, very pleased to see such, such a correspondence for, for such complicated geometries uh, relative to previous uh, theories. Okay. Uh, so, so here is, uh, I just flashed this because I don't want to go into details, but our attempt at understanding more microscopically what each element, uh, functional element, if the network is doing. For instance, ReLU uh, uh, stages are increasing the dimensionality and that's kind of expected from nonlinearities, but suppress what it shows here in the x-axis correlations. Uh, so it kind of does decorrelation. I didn't talk about correlations, but if you look at dimensionality, ReLU increases dimensionality, pooling decreases dimensionality, so this is dimensionality. Uh, and similarly for, for radius, you can see that um, uh, here, uh, for instance, uh, this stage, uh, full and ReLU is substantially decreasing uh, uh, radius, uh, and there are more details, but I'll skip them. Uh, here I, I want to show ResNet. It's a beautiful set of, uh, of, uh, of results. I, in my view, this is ResNet 152, 
and you see this long, uh, long skip, uh, stick units, and you see this flat regions of uh, in very gradual changes, and then there are these uh, transitions which have to do with downsampling, uh, which reduces the R. So that's actually uh, intrigues me in, in, in light of uh, the previous talk by, by Iran, because that actually shows that shrinking the width is very important for, for this network, rather than expansion of the width. Uh, so I don't know. OK, the same for dimensionality. You see these flat regions, and then this sudden decrease in, in, radio, uh, in dimensionality, exactly when you downsample the network. Then this is a final downsampling, and again, a huge decrease in dimensionality at the end. And similarly, for the capacity, you see a flat increase in capacity, more or less, and then uh, finally increase, in, increase uh, in, in the last stages. So you can ask, OK, do we need all these skips? Maybe, maybe we don't need them. Uh, it, it's not easy to answer this question, because it's not easy to manipulate, to, to skip a skip. And what do you do? You retrain or not retrain. So it's not easy to do a causal, a causal uh, a perturbation. Uh, but uh, uh, we think that this is not the case, that actually the, this gradual, this is more like a line attractor for people that understand uh, this uh, jargon in computational neuroscience. This, there is a, a gradual drift across an almost a line attractor uh, by this identi almost identity maps. But this gradual drift is important because it's kind of bring the system to a point where it's kind of this, this uh, identity map is unstable and goes off to, uh, uh, to, to the right solution. OK. So, uh, so that's uh, the, the summary of, of that part. So accessible object information is mo monotonically increasing with layer number in terms, of, in terms of capacity, which is more or less monotonically increasing, although it's, uh, uh, as we saw, most of the increase in the last layers. Uh, and uh, pixel layers, uh, quantitatively, one can say it's almost like random points. Not exactly. There's slight improvement, but almost like random points. So you can see that we can, we can actually say qualitatively that, that the manifolds uh, begin almost like random and then have this uh, very nice uh, compact structure with high capacity. Uh, there the, are uh, correlations, which I didn't discuss. Um, and, uh, and, and again, the learning, which I just mentioned, uh, that uh, the first epochs of learning uh, actually do the, the, the most of the job. So the question is, uh, can we apply a similar framework, similar concept of capacity and geometry to real neural data? Now, the problem with neural data is, as usual, there is a, the, the, the yeah. sparse uh, and, uh, uh, and noisy and so on. So, uh, Anyway, we, we have some modest attempts. So this is an example of uh, trying to characterize object manifolds in macaque uh, visual cortex uh, from Jim DeCarlo's lab. This is a student, Joel, and, and a former postdoc. Uh, there the, the are a set of images uh, belonging to categories that are shown to, uh, to, to, the, to the monkey. Uh, so there are several, I don't know, 40 images or something per category, per object, are shown to the monkey. Uh, there is no, I don't think there is a task, but, uh, and altogether there are 100 neurons. Uh, uh, so there are two layers, uh, they're coded from V4, some intermediate layer in the visual cortex, and IT, which is the last, which is more or less the object layer in visual cortex. You can think about it as the top feature layer of visual cortex. So um, what we do is uh, basically take uh, the neural data, so for each stimulus for each image, there are many trials, repetitions of the same image shown to the monkey, and a collected collection of the neural responses. Uh, so for each neuron, there are several trials, and they are noisy, but we average, the no we average this um, trial-to-trial uh, uh, variability. So we only look at, at the firing rate or average firing of each neuron in each one of the layers, IT of before, for each one of the stimuli. So that's why we generate a, a point, one point in the, in the state space of the, uh, of the network of the population per stimulus. And now we look at the collection of points per, uh, per object and collection of those manifolds and we ask how many of them can be linearly separable based on the quality of the responses, the actual neural responses uh, to these images. OK, so that's uh, the same task. Uh, we, we are taking those points. Collect, uh, collect them, collect them, organize them uh, in manifolds, 
And we do, again, a, a binary random labeling of those manifolds. Again, each, uh, each response vectors within a manifold have the same, the same label, binary label. OK, so that's the task. Uh, and we compare the, the performance, the quality of capacity and, and geometry of the same set of data, uh, of, of images, but now propagated through a trained uh, a network like VGG. Okay, so that's what you see here. So this is now capacity uh, based on the neural data for V4 for the population of neurons in V4 and population of nodes in IT cortex. And this is the increase of capacity of the same based on the same uh, images propagated through the layers of the uh, of the deep convolutional network. And what you see here that if you try to match the capacity with the layers, it kind of makes sense. The V4 is kind of maybe intermediate uh, um, uh, convolutional layer, whereas IT is perhaps the last max pooling or maybe the first uh, fully connected, but really at the top uh, stages of the uh, of the uh, of this network. So that's. Uh, that's kind of intriguing similarity. Um, you can ask also whether this corresponds to the geometry. So now it's harder to say about dimensionality because it has this, uh, again, the, the IT has lower dimension than V4, so it's more compact in terms of the geometry, which is good. Um, however, to, co to correspond to, to uh, again, the geometry in the VGG is, is harder to say because for V4, it's harder to say because there is this flat going up and down. It's not monotonic. But uh, for IT, it's definitely, again, one of those uh, uh, last, last convolutional or, or first uh, fully connected uh, network correspondence. And now here, the dimensionality, uh, the, the radii, um, again, for V4, it's noisy. Uh, IT seems, again, to be, uh, a lot, uh, to be a match in more or less the same, uh, the same area. So, we have three measures, capacity, radius, dimension, that we can, each one of them, we can ask what is the correspondence to the deep convolutional networks. There are other measures, uh, two measures of correlations, which I didn't talk about, correlations between manifolds, and uh, those we can also apply, and we have also applied, and we can ask the same question, whether they, they match at the same point, where we can say, well, layer number 13, 31 in VGG is IT cortex, and layer number 25 correspond to V4. Well, the answer is not quite. Uh, particularly uh, for, for the geometry and capacity, there is relatively nice correspondence, but correlations are, are, are very different uh, in the real brain from the, uh, from the artificial uh, neural network. So, so we think there are some similarities, but there are some discrepancies as well. OK. so. Uh, do I have 10 more minutes? OK. So I want to, I want to switch uh, to, uh, uh, to a generalization. And, and the, the reason is the following. When we try to more broadly capture the notion of uh, representation of objects in, in the brain, or let's say in IT cortex, and we ask, what is, what is the goal? What is achieved in IT cortex? So what I showed you, what I spoke until now, you can think about it as saying, well, IT cortex is really compacting, reducing the dimensionality, shrinking the manifolds in, in, in radia, so that uh, so arbitrary classification based on object identity can be performed in downstream, in downstream uh, uh, systems, so kind of high-capacity calculation that can be done by downstream from IT cortex. Uh, that's one aspect. But there can be alternative view which says, well, that's what the brain cares about is not, not so much about capacity. Maybe there is enough neurons, actually, to even sustain lower capacity because capacity is per neuron. If there are millions and millions of neurons in IT cortex, then maybe that's not the real uh, bottleneck. Maybe the, the more important issue, or at least uh, as important as capacity, will be generalization. So the ability to learn what I mean by generalization here, the ability to learn a new object, a new concept, a new category based on a few examples. So you can, of course, ask about generalization to begin with that we have ImageNet uh, classes and we show only subset of the points and we train and then we look at generalization uh, in, that, in that respect. But 
Here what I'm focusing on generalization in the sense of learning new concepts or new objects. So you have a mature brain, we don't care about how it got to it, we have the IT cortex, and we ask whether the representation of this feature layer supports, is sufficiently good for a generic object that if you show a subject a, new, uh, a few examples from a new object, he never sees, uh, 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 he never saw this, uh, have never seen it before, uh, it will be able to recognize it in, in, the, in the sense of generalizing from, from, from a, few, a few examples. That's a question, an empirical question, the question uh, uh, whether, whether, it's, whether this will be the case in, in the case of represent, uh, neural representation IT cortex. So that's what uh, you formalize by, by few shot learning. A few shot learning, learn a new category by a few examples uh, and generalize, it, generalize from it. And the question that we ask is, um, in general, if you have a representation of these manifolds, uh, what requires, uh, uh, what will uh, require, uh, uh, the, uh, what will require for the geometry of the manifolds to support a few shot learning? What type of geometry, uh, how much they have to be shrunk, how much dimensionality have to be slow, small, and so on? Uh, are, the diff are the geometry here is the same as the geometry for the high capacity or the different notions of geometry. And in general, we believe that geometry uh, for, for neural computation is, is, is really tied to the type of computation that you are you're asking. You can do PCA and define geometry in many other ways. Uh, I have shown geometric measures by anchors which had to do with the linear classification, high capacity linear classification. So the question is whether geometry in the context of few-shot learning is, is the same uh, anchor point based, uh, uh, based statistics, uh, RMNDM, or, or, or different. So it's ongoing work, but there are some intriguing results. It's uh, primarily by Ben uh, from a PhD student of Surya in, at Stanford. Um, uh, and, and you have the Shalit, uh, so, so he is probably in, the, in, in Mossad or something. I don't have, uh, I, I don't have a picture of him. Uh, but he, he is a master student at the Hebrew University. Okay, so, so, so this, this problem has been studied also in, uh, extensively in the literature in the artificial deep network. So typically you, you train based a category is based on a few set of images and you test whether you can now categorize the images based uh, uh, or, or the train images based on new tests but uh, I'm sorry uh, showing a new category and, and can you identify it from a few, a few examples and we want to formalize it so uh, and these are another set of uh, examples from uh, 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 from learning some new uh, new tools or new objects from a few examples of some something we have never seen uh, or, or language uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, so we want to formalize it. What, what does it mean to be able to learn a new category uh, by uh, uh, by a few a few examples uh, based on kind of manifold concept of, of category? So here is our uh, is our definition. So. Again, we have a population of nodes in a given layer. So this is the end state, uh, this, the n-dimensional state space. Each point is, uh, is, is, uh, is an input, an image, for instance. And now, so suppose you have uh, a point. So suppose I'm showing uh, the network two new categories, which are the underlying, uh, the underlying manifold of this uh, ellipsoid. Okay? So we have two ellipsoids, two new ellipsoids. And we are showing only two points, one uh, for each manifold. So pairs of manifolds, the task is simply to discriminate, to learn to discriminate between pairs of concepts that you have not seen before, based on just two examples, positive example and negative example. So now you have, so now what the network will do, what the subject will do if it just has this task. So our hypothesis is that the, that the, the subject will draw a hyperplane, it's easy, there's two points in high dimension, but you draw a hyperplane with max margin. That will be the kind of the, the, uh, the, uh, the regularizer that the subject will use. Uh, and the question is then, based on these two points and a max margin separating between them, how good it will do in, uh, in, in, uh, in guessing the, the, other, 
uh, the other labels. So you can see here in examples that, uh, you know, this will be an example which is a good guess, but this will be, uh, a, 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 but if, if, the, if the max margin plane is here, these two, of course, are correctly classified, but the, now there are, there are errors. So turns out we can do the, the math for two-shot learning of high-dimensional ellipsoid. And it's amazingly simple uh, result. So, so the, each ellipsoid are, uh, so let's say they have the same geometry, but different orientation and location. So each, uh, the, the ellipsoid structure is given by a set of radii in the, the principal axis. Uh, uh, so these are this R, vector R, and they reside in D dimension, so this D. Uh, and uh, the, the generalization error based on one, manifold, one point per new manifold is given by this, uh, uh, this cumulative uh, uh, error function, uh, which is the argument is the square root of d times effective r to the 4 minus 1. The effective, so d is the dimensionality, uh, and, and the effective r is, normal, is the, the fourth moment uh, of, the, uh, in, of the radii of the spectrum uh, divided by, normalized by the distance between them. So it's amazingly simple, only the dimensionality and, and the radius, but this radius is much simpler than, than this manifold and anchor points, and et cetera. It's simply the fourth moment uh, of, of, uh, of, the, of the actual spectra. Okay? And the reason why it is simpler is because the task is simpler. We're not talking about a manifold surrounded by many high-capacity manifolds, different orientation, and it's very hard to find uh, the constraint, the, the, the max margin. Here is a much simpler problem. This is why the geometry, which is, uh, which is entailing this, which controlling this task is very simple. Okay, so that's, that's a very simple uh, 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 formula, and you can actually uh, unpack it. So for instance, uh, if the radius, as I define it, the effective radius is less than a critical value, which my definition is one, it's perfect learning, which means that the, just two examples, one per, per ellipsoid, will give you zero, will give you perfect performance on any other points on the, on the ellipsoid. And then above it, it's kind of exponentially, it, it's very small and then uh, it takes off exponentially uh, from, from, uh, from zero. Uh, so that's one perfect linear. Another, another interesting result is that the dimensionality actually is, 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 is the, the higher the dimensionality is, the better the performance is which is again against what we had before, of course, where, where it was crucial to reduce the dimensionality uh, in order to get high capacity uh, uh, computation or separation. Here it's the opposite. When the dimensionality of the manifolds are higher, the, everything else is fixed, then the error, the, the few shot generalization error is lower. And the reason is that, uh, you know, if you, if you think about your weight vector uh, uh, guess, and you look at the projection of the entire uh, manifold on the weight vector, they become more narrower, more, cent more centered, uh, the, the higher the dimensionality. So that's kind of an interesting, uh, somewhat counterintuitive, at least the beginning, uh, uh, initially, a result about how the dimensionality uh, is affecting the ability to, uh, uh, to learn with a few examples. Another interesting result is what happens if you have more examples? So if you have m points per ellipsoid, there's a very simple scaling law which says it's the same, the same story. You can collapse all these curves to the one scaling curve, but simply the effective r, the effective dimension, uh, radius, is scaled by m to the one fold. So it's a very simple scaling law predicting the, the, how, the, how the performance improves when you add more examples per, uh, per manifold in this few shot learning. So that's very nice. Very nice theory about ellipsoid. You can ask, okay, what is, has to do anything with real life? Data is not ellipsoids. They're, 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 who knows what they are? Okay, so, but before that, just one more point. Uh, and this is, I, I, I said that, uh, the, the, that the few shot learning is controlled by an effective radius and, and dimension. I was assuming that the two ellipsoids are differently oriented and placed in different places, but but they, are, they have the same geometry. But what about if they don't have the same geometry? So it turns out it's easily uh, extended to the case where, where they don't have the same geometry uh, and you want to uh, look at the error of, uh, of uh, 
of, of ellipsoid one uh, uh, from ellipsoid two, then you are the, the effective radius has correction due to the to the radius of the other ellipsoid. So it doesn't matter the details, but the, the theory incorporates also cases where the two manifolds, in, at least the two ellipsoids, have different geometry. Okay. Good, so now I'm back to the question, what, what happens in real life? Well, for us, real life is, uh, is ImageNet. So, okay, <laughs> so, uh, so one thing is that uh, we, we are now doing the, the, uh, the real thing which one has to do, I'll show you, but uh, which is taking untrained, uh, uh, um, uh, untrained uh, categories and showing the trained networks. And see. But what I'll do here is something, a cheat, I'll take after training the network with all the full-blown training of ImageNet, I pick two categories from the trained ones. Uh, so it's not exactly what we need, but let's look at how it looks like. Put two categories, uh, two points from pair of categories, propagate them through the top layer, and then ask whether the top layer will, will do uh, few shot learning on, on separating between these two. Okay, so, um, okay, and and the results are, are intriguingly, uh, intriguingly similar to, uh, to the theory. So this is an example of, of, of this uh, learning generalized from a few shots, from two examples, from one uh, object category against another object category, but you can choose the other object from many different other objects, or make many, many pairs, pairing of, of this one, Different pairs will have different distance from this uh, object, so uh, so this gives us these points here. So there are there are pairs which there are there are categories which are far away from this in the sense that the radii, the relative to the distance is small, and there are ones which are very close to it. So uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. So there are ones which are very far away, so the relative radii is small. There are ones which are very close to it, so the effective radii is high because the radii is normalized relative to the distance between the manifolds. So they kind of span this entire regime, but they fall very nicely on the theoretical curve. So it's amazing, uh, uh, amazing, and maybe I don't know, accidental agreement between naive ellipsoids. So what we do here is take each one of this, uh, 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 this uh, point manifold and look at the spectrum uh, and then use this as, as our ellipsoid. Basically, okay. Here are other examples, um, and also uh, now if we do the if you do the the M uh, shot learning experiments on ImageNet, and collapse all the day uh, all the uh, a few examples here from uh, uh, M equals to one, three, and five, and collapse them into the scaling the scaling regime. They they follow the scaling line. So this naive theory about ellipsoid seem to be working for this, for this problem of few shot learning. This is an example of three shot learning of, of in ResNet. Um, here is interesting because here we take into account more seriously the difference in the geometry between the pairs and some correlations. So it's more sophisticated theory and so on. But again, it's, it looks like very nice, uh, very nice agreement. Again, what I'm showing here is the generalization error uh, discriminating between a particular uh, one example from a particular manifold and, and another example from, uh, from, it, from another from a manifold, but the other manifold is chosen from the, all the other possibilities. So this is what gives this, uh, these points which, which uh, span the, 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 the X regime. So the different radii are not necessarily mean different sizes of the manifold. It could be, but it's more, more closely related probably to the different distance of the manifolds from this manifold, which because of the normalization of the sizes, it effectively, it means that the effective radii are, are changing. Okay, so the, the bottom line is that uh, there, are, uh, there are a few cases, happy cases, uh, pairs of manifolds that are sufficiently dissimilar. So they give very small uh, error after three-shot learning here. Uh, but the other ones are, there are also bad cases, poor cases where the error is substantial. So three-shot learning, for instance, will not be enough. Okay, now what about held out cases? So this is, as I said, is a cheat because I used pairs of manifolds from the training, uh, uh, from the training set. So these are examples 
uh, of held out classes from the ImageNet. ImageNet itself is much bigger than the one that used in those uh, competitions. And here is kind of a summary of the preliminary results. So what you see here is uh, histograms of the generalization error for pairwise uh, discrimination uh, of a manifold based on, on two examples. So, so what I showed before is pairs of trained uh, manifolds. So this is this histogram. Uh, and, and this one is the distribution that you get from held out. So you see that the top layer of the, the conclusion is the top layer of, uh, of, let's say, VGG in this case, is not really generating a generic enough good representation of objects. Because if it, what, if, it, if, it, if it were so, then it would not be discriminating in this case between uh, the, the two histograms should be more or less the same. That it, it should not overfit. The, this is kind of an overfitting in the context of visual learning. Um, but nevertheless, this is not random. And here you see the, the same task, but for the pre, from the initial network, with the same architecture, but random ways. And you see it's much worse than, of course, even this one. So there is a substantial improvement in the representation even of non-trained uh, held out uh, object, new object that the network has never seen, but it's still uh, uh, not the same as the ones that the network ha has seen. And the question is then, uh, can we use this discrepancy to actually uh, build an improved learning to, uh, um, to enforce the, the system, not only to learn the basic task of object classification of whatever category, 10,000 categories, but also to force the system to uh, to generate a representation that is good enough to uh, to generate uh, uh, a, 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 to a, a very uh, a very uh, good accuracy of uh, generalization on on a few examples for new categories. So that's one of the challenges that uh, that we have. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, from theoretical perspective, it's I think it's uh, those results are part of a, a, a larger framework which is to put theory, statistical mechanics, or otherwise for kind of realistic uh, structures and, and tasks. Um, as I said, the, go the goal going moving forward is to use the geometry not only as analysis and, and comparison, uh, but also as regularizer for, for better learning. Uh, is there a relation of these two adversarial examples? Are anchor points, for instance, related to adversarial examples or not? We don't know, it's intriguing to suspect that maybe there is a relation. Um, and um, as I said, uh, our tools uh, are, are one way to ask whether uh, convolutional networks have achieved the, the, the role to, uh, to uh, represent nicely a kind of generic object, even ones that have not been seen. And uh, for, for the brain, uh, these are, I just showed two complementary possible measures of really asking what IT Cortex has achieved in terms of object representation, and there is more work to, to do into looking more, more neural data uh, and analysis, and this, of course, in the context of the broader question of the interface between AI and the brain. Okay, these are, these are the references and funding, and I would like to advertise our small center for the science of deep learning at the Hebrew University and I hope to have future um, collaboration with uh, DeepMath of Princeton. Thank you. Uh, it, 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 we've already strikingly seen how the manifold geometry mm. shows only a very small contribution in the early layers. And you said that drift was important. As, as a neurobiologist, I'd like to, of course, remind us that the brain seems to make do with many fewer layers from retina through LGN, V1, V2 to V4. And, and the question is, what does that tell us about how we could improve the design of networks by doing more of what the nervous system does at the expense of perhaps putting in those endless convolutional layers with a few you know, sparse ReLUs or so on in, in interspersed there? Um, it's, it's a good question, and we can speculate uh, about it. But let me say a few words. One is that for the lack uh, of time, I, I did not talk about 
correlations, which deserves a whole talk by itself. So there are various types of correlations that are important. One is between manifold centers, and the other one is between the axis of variations of the manifold. And, and those aspects uh, I, I, I haven't shown, uh, but uh, we analyze them also across uh, layers. And they, uh, what they show is an interesting pattern that at least for the artificial networks, the correlation between manifolds are strongly suppressed at the first layers. So we claim that an important complementary um, uh, role of these deep convolutional layers, particularly at early stages, is decorrelation. Now, the notion of decorrelation is old in computational neuroscience and in, uh, in, in, in neural computation in general, but, it, but this is in kind of more specific uh, uh, context of manifold correlation. Uh, rather than just uh, more generic kind of ICA type of, uh, of correlation. So that's one point. Another point is how many layers are in, in cortex, you know, you can, you can, how many stages? You can say, well, maybe each layer, maybe each cell type. It's, it's, it's a valid question, but I, I cannot, cannot compare. Now, but at least with artificial networks, we, we do empirically see that the long, that those longer networks have better final performance. Now, this is not controlled, but it's an observation. So this is the basis of my speculation, or my intuition is that, and we know from dynamical systems and other nonlinear phenomena that, that there are cases where there are, the phenomena contains of two epochs, one which is a gradual change up to some bifurcation point, and that allows the system to take off. So that was the basis of my speculation, but it's, 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 it requires uh, uh, science. Okay? Um, while we're taking questions with the next three speakers, the contributed talks, please come up. Um, I have a quick question. Yeah. So would you consider additional structures such as sparsity, which is often considered to play a role in separating uh, complex manifolds in kind of a, a higher dimensional space, would you consider that under the, the idea of correlations that you didn't discuss, or would you consider that a separate issue that we should? Uh, it, it, might, it might actually, uh, it might actually not, it, it could do both, but it could actually also improve the representation of, uh, shrink the, what I call the radius of the, of the manifold. From other work that we have done, not as sophisticated as this with Bakhtash Babadi, on a simpler kind of uh, Gaussian mixture model of, as inputs. So the manifolds are simply spheres, high dimensional spheres, and we propagate them through layers, through particularly through sparse layers, and we show that the sparsity is really what the, what the main thing that it achieves is effectively shrinking those, those, uh, those radians. Those, so I think sparsity plays also an important role here. Again, some of the layers are very sparse in this artificial network. But in order to actually prove that, one has to manipulate the sparsity in these networks, which is harder to do than in our small scale networks with the work with Babadi. But yes, I believe sparsity is important also here. Let's thank Chaim one more time. Oh.